I'm Marsha Pally. And uh, in thinking about the moral challenges of our time, which is the very challenging title of this program, uh, Jonathan Sachs and Carol Gillen and I began by thinking about what these two very wise people want to say about what we can do now with our present world as it is to experience less strife, more productive relations and policy, but we also want to talk about how we can draw on our resources, what we have now to change what we have and build a future of greater flourishing. In our pre-conversation, yes, we cheated, we had one. <laughs> uh, Jonathan Sachs immediately said, listening, let's talk about listening. And Carol immediately jumped in with her work on radical listening, meaning the hard work that hears to the root of what the other is saying. Jonathan Sachs added his version of aerobic listening, which gives us some idea of how he spends his gym time. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to talk about listening, and I thought I'd begin with one quick framing thought before Carol Gilligan and Jonathan Sachs take over. And that framing thought is that listening presupposes something. There's a precondition. And that something is what these two wise people have also thought a great deal about. That thing is covenant. Listening to someone else whom one may disagree with or fear or hate presupposes that that person is worth listening to as a group, as an individual, and that all of you, are, of all of us, are in some way in an ongoing relation in this world where it is terribly important to listen to each other, and that's based on covenantal understanding of our world. Covenantal relations are a precondition of listening, and it has a few parts. It's reciprocal, each is for the flourishing of the other. It is irrevocable through the greatest of breaches. And perhaps mo most importantly, while contracts pursue interests, covenant protects relationship mm. because that is how we thrive and how we get things done. If we had a covenantal understanding of our human condition, how would that affect the way we listen to each other. I mean, if we really th understood all of our daily lives and all of our policies as embedded in a covenantal understanding, a kind of covenantal setup, and how can our listening get us to greater appreciation of our reciprocal interdependence? So we will hear about this and much more, I'm sure, in the next hour. And I thought perhaps, Carol, we could start with you because I understand that you've just returned from a terrific experience of some radical listening and something like reciprocal commitment. <laughs> well, so there's no mystery about it. I've just returned from Israel um, where I was involved in the journey to peace of Women Wage Peace, uh, an extraordinary organization uh, that began in 2014 after the Gaza War, where a group of women got together and said, basically, this cannot go on. This has to stop. This must stop. And then they said, uh, we need a new language. Uh, we need a different voice. And uh, women must be involved in every step of the negotiation. So they committed themselves. In 2014, they gave themselves four years to persuade their political leaders to reach an agreement to end the conflict. So you can count. Here we are uh, in 2017. And this year, they had a journey to peace. And I think it, it uh, the journey to peace, first of all, what's extraordinary and related to what you said, Marcia, is uh, Women Wage Peace involves women across all the divisions, Israeli, Palestinian, Jewish, Arab, young women and old women, religious women and secular women, uh, women from moderate settlements and women from Tel Aviv. 
And the first thing that they said is they need a non-binary language. That is a language that everyone, that doesn't contain the oppositions, but a language that can open the way to a different kind of listening. So the event uh, that I just came back from was held in the Judean desert, uh, way down near the Dead Sea, uh, near the Jordan River, in Area C of Israel, where Palestinians can come without a permit. And they built these two really huge tents because there were thousands of women. I wish I could show you uh, the picture, but you can Google it and see it. Um, and the tent was a tent of reconciliation, which was to reconcile the children of the four mothers, Sarah and Hagar. And so, I mean, as an example of covenant and listening, um, this was an, ex I mean, I'm still, I, <laughs> I just was writing something about it. And I confess that there's a moment in every day where on my computer or on my phone, I, I pull up this photograph of this march because it was so hopeful and it was, Rabbi, so joyous, really all of the women. I think that's a, an absolutely terrific story. And it's just a beautiful illustration of what you've written about for so long and what I found and other people have found life-changing. And it's a lesson we need within the Jewish community. I remember way back in 2000 at the Hebrew University, I organized a big conference to see if we could bring religious and secular and the different strands of Judaism together. And we had academics from all strands in Israel and from 16 different countries, from Harvard, from Princeton, from Yale. And they covered all the, all, the, all the strands and all the ways of thinking. After two days, I said to Elaine, you know, there's good news and bad news about the Jewish people. The good news is we're among the world's best speakers. The world's uh -oh. best what? Speakers. Oh. <laughs> the bad news is we're probably the world's worst listeners. <laughs> there was actually no listening going on at all. And I thought to myself, this is actually a spiritual problem, and I want to explain why. You would have thought that for a religion with 613 commands, there has to be a biblical word that means to obey. In biblical Hebrew, there is no word that means to obey. And the absence of this word was so acute that when Ben Yehuda restored Hebrew as a spoken language in the 19th century, and you needed a word that means obey, he chose the word letzayet, which is an Aramaic word, not a Hebrew one. What word does the Bible have instead of to obey? Shema. To listen. Which means to listen, to hear, to understand, to internalize and to respond indeed. So Shema Yisrael, the key and fundamental mitzvah of Judaism mm. is to learn how to listen. In fact, in my Sidur, the Koran Sidur, you will see in order to emphasize it, I translated Shema Yisrael not as hear, O Israel, as it's usually translated, but listen, O Israel. Now, we saw the the, I, I had the incredible gift. I am one of the world's worst listeners. But I had the incredible blessing to be married to Elaine, who is undoubtedly one of the world's greatest listeners, and who has taught me that listening really is a spiritual art. And one of the things I found it difficult to explain to non-Jews is that as a, as a chief rabbi, I had to, obviously, as a religious leader, I had to expound on the benefits of marriage. But because in Jewish law, we have this problem of the aguna, the woman who can't get a divorce from her husband and thus is a chained wife, a fair amount of my time was helping people to get divorced. 
So we did a lot of stuff, prenuptial agreements, get legislation, all this stuff, communal sanctions against recalcitrant husbands. But it left us with some residual cases where the husband refused to give a divorce. And cases that had been going on for years and years and years. Every English court had failed. Every rabbinical court had failed. And so I decided on a surprising tactic. I decided I'm going to mediate this with a lady who was a speech therapist, sadly no longer alive, who really was the world's most aerobic listener. And the two of us sat, but, I mean, obviously, in order to get this to work, we had to it spent a few days making sure that the young couple would sit with us with no lawyers and no parents sitting in the room and all the rest of it. And they agreed just to sit with the two of us, myself and a speech therapist who'd never been engaged in marital or divorce counseling because I knew she was the best listener I ever heard. And she sat, we sat for seven hours and her listening drew all the poison out of that relationship until after seven hours her sheer power of listening got the young man to give his wife a divorce and thus free her. And she said to me after they left, Jonathan, what a shame. We didn't meet them three months ago because if we had, we could have saved the marriage. Oh, wow. And that moment made me realize in the most vivid way mm. how listening can solve the most seemingly intractable problem. I think the world is short on listening today. I think the whole world has become Jewish. <laughs> because, you know, what's happening on universities, they're shouting down or they're banning speakers that they don't agree with in the name of safe space. And the truth is a safe space is one where people who disagree with you listen to you with respect. And listening needs to be brought back into the world, and it will solve local conflicts. And even the most intractable of all, if Israelis and Palestinians, if Jews and Muslims can finally learn, after all these years since Sarah and Hagar, the time has come to listen to one another. One of the places that I've learned my lessons about listening is in um, interreligious theology and interreligious work. And so I'd like to bring um, the Reverend Joel Hunter's um, voice of what you just said, uh, which is the first thing that you do when you talk to somebody you think you disagree with or you hate or you fear is find out why the other side is for the other side. And that's a very kind of deep listening that can undo the entire structure of the kind of animosity that you just described. Is that what you found was going on with the various women you encountered or in other places in the Middle East? You know, what's, what was so striking to me about um, the women waged peace is they really appreciated what was involved in listening. I mean, how in a sense, what it, calls, what it calls from in you to listen to somebody who you may disagree with. And one of the things that, was, that they came to, because they have thought so carefully about these questions. That's why I think I'm reluctant to, to speak in any sense for them. But one of the things they, they knew is that you had to start with what they call a non-binary language. In other words, you have to be very thoughtful about how you're going to cast the conversation so that it is really a conversation which invites people to come into it. And it is a conversation where they can be listened to, I would put it, in their own voice, in their own terms. So in other words, to enter the conversation doesn't mean they have to buy into your framework or your way of seeing the world. So for example, one of the things that's been very hard for them they get criticized from the left because they won't use the word settlement or occupation. 
but because they want to include people who live in some, and there are women from the settlements who say, if there's a peace agreement, we will move behind the Green Line, which is extraordinary. Because the people who live there, that's not how they think about their world. So, you know, what I say to my students, and it really is effective because it, it, it does shift your thing, is I say, notice what happens when you replace judgment with curiosity. So it, instead of coming to you to sort of judge you, which means I'm going to see where you fit on my map of the world, uh, I do what you've just talked about, which is I become very interested in how you see your world. And I think, in, you know, for me personally, that the more incomprehensible it is to me how somebody could see the world in a way that to me makes no sense, the more curious I become how is it that from your point of view, this is how you look at the world? So, you know, when I talk about radical listening and listen, meaning two things, which is that the word radical means root. So how do you listen for the question, where is this conversation coming from? Where is it rooted? In other words, what are, you know, literally, where are its roots? How do you get to, to this and then the other meaning of radical, which is transformative, that this is a conversation which could change things. And as far as in my experience, and it's, it's really has been exhilarating, I have seen this group in Israel, uh, this group of very diverse women, really struggling to have a conversation that could change things because the one thing they are convinced of is that things have to change. They cannot go on in the way they have. So. And of course, um, one of the things I think we were talking about before was Freud's troubled relationship uh, with Judaism and Jewish values. And yet I think, perhaps almost without realizing it, Freud did one of the most Jewish things imaginable. He actually called psychoanalysis the speaking cure. But actually, it psychoanalysis is the, listening cure. is the listening cure. And it is the act of listening that does cure and allow you, know, you to. Yeah, you know. I was going to say, he said something in his studies on hysteria uh, that was extraordinary, which, is, which was basically his studies of women. Hmm. He said, the patient knows everything of pathological significance, in other words, everything of significance to her illness, but she may not know that she knows it. So the only way that he, initially, this is in his early work, could come to know what he needed to know in order to help this other person was to listen for what she knew but didn't know that she knew. And I don't know if you've noticed, but it actually affected the English language. Um, until relatively recently, every metaphor we had for knowing or understanding was basically visual. Mm -hmm. We talk about foresight, hindsight, insight. We talk about somebody's perspective, somebody's point of view. We talk about a man of vision. We talk. A, when you understand something, you say, ah, I see. And that is the, basically the Hellenistic tradition, which is very visually oriented. It's only once psychoanalysis came to America that this new locution suddenly appeared in the English language. I hear you. Mm -hmm. I hear where you're coming from. And that is an unexpected uh, consequence of psychoanalysis and the way it affected, uh, as it were, the American soul and the American language. Mm. And I just love the story that Viktor Frankl used to take, uh, tell about when he was psychotherapist in Vienna and he had a patient who calmly called him up one night at two in the morning and said, Dr. Frankl, I, uh, I know you've treated me for several years. Um, and I respect you gratefully, but I have to tell you that all your 
therapy has failed and I've decided that life isn't worth living and I'm going to commit suicide. And Frankel kept her on the phone for two hours, giving her reason after reason after reason to live. And after two hours, she said, Dr. Frankel, you've changed my mind. I'm not going to commit suicide. The next day, he went around to see her and said, which of my arguments persuaded you? <laughs> and she said, none of them. They were all total rubbish. <laughs> so he said, why did you decide to live? She said, the fact that somebody could listen to me for two hours <laughs> in the middle of the night convinced me life was worth living. Well, that's a so, story. So, you know, if this can work at a micro level, it can work at a macro level. It's very delicate. It's easily disturbed and destroyed. But it is transformative. I think this is one of the uh, emerging outcomes of our print-centric building uh, on what you were saying, our print-centric culture. There's uh, my favorite 15th century priest who worked in the Vatican, and how many of them, I mean, after all, do you have, was Nicholas of Cusa, who objected to perspective in painting for its ocular, ocular centrism, hmm. um, in that he held that it gave one visual perspective on things, and not only that, chose for you the viewer, which perspective to have. Whereas the earlier um, form of painting um, provided you with a landscape to choose what you were going to see. And he preferred, over ocular centrism, the activity of listening, because it's a dialogue, at least, if not a trialogue, and beyond. Um, I would add one point, actually, Marsha, and it's an interesting one because you asked about interfaith dialogue as well. <clears throat> there was one little essay, it's almost unknown, uh, but should be widely known by Franz Rosenzweig, called The New Thinking, in which he talked about speech thinking. Uh, and he contrasted two words that we often use interchangeably, dialogue and conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He said, platonic dialogue, you always know what's going to happen. Socrates is going to meet a know-it-all. He's going to ask him a series of questions. At the end, the know-it-all will be so confused that he finally confesses. He doesn't know what he's <laughs> talking about. And you know the end in, the adv in advance. That's dialogue. Whereas in conversation, you don't know how it's going to end. You don't know how it's going to go. You only know that in unpredictable ways, both of you will be changed right. at the end. Mm -hmm. If this remarkable story about the couple is possible, and this remarkable story about these women is possible, how can we enlarge our practice of listening in society so that we do much more of that rather than sealing ourselves off in bubbles and in groups and out groups <laughs> and finding, which I think is very pernicious, that I feel better when I dehumanize or stop listening or stop being curious about the other. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I find myself disagreeing with you, Marsha. I don't think anyone actually feels better when they do that. <clears throat> I mean, they may. I mean, it's, it's almost like building a fence for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so you may feel protected by doing that. So I found myself wanting to, to add to this conversation that I think it's a huge, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's a huge risk to listen to somebody, mm -hmm. meaning really to listen, meaning to open, you know, my view of the world to your experience and particularly, but of course it's true for anybody, your experience is different from my experience. So if I really go to you because I think, uh, and I think you said this in the opening, that if I listen to you, I will learn something I don't know. Um, then I have to be willing to have, you know, to have my world shaken. So 
to me, the question about listening is, what are the conditions in which, you know, we venture forth to another person with that kind of curiosity or openness that we can really be interested in what their experience is and willing to risk that we could learn something that could change it. I think that's the barrier to listening, I really do. And I think, you know, you almost, if I'm not mistaken, quite briefly, but very tantalizingly, in that book, In a Different Voice, almost hinted that there was a difference here between a Hellenistic approach and a Hebraic approach. Yeah, you, you saw my Hebrew school coming out. It was, it was <laughs> terrific stuff. And I think to myself, you know, we're not very good at listening within the Jewish community, but there are things that tradition has given us that make us more receptive to it if, if only we can overcome our resistance. Famously, for instance, we have right at the beginning of the Bible two completely different accounts of creation. What you were talking about in terms of perspective, you have completely, you know, Genesis 1, the view from nowhere, you know, the cosmos, and Genesis 2, the first man, the first woman, God is suddenly not up there, he's down there planting a garden, matchmaking, oh, he's not married, let's make him a wife, and the whole stuff. And you know, you're, you're constantly thrown into these different perspectives. I pointed out in my <laughs> book against religiously motivated violence, not in God's name, how in the story of Hagar and Ishmael, when mm -hmm. Sarah has Isaac and then has Hagar and Ishmael. Get rid Sarah, of her, right? There's no way you can read that story and not identify with Hagar and Ishmael and not with Sarah and Isaac. You're almost forced against your will to identify with the people who've been sent into exile. Likewise, that horrendous scene in Genesis 27 where Jacob is dressed up in Esau's clothes and who are you, my son? I'm your son Esau. And then he leaves and then Esau comes in with the food he's prepared for his father and slowly aged Isaac and young Esau who clearly love one another suddenly realize this deception that's been perfect. There's no way you can read that and not sympathize with Esau rather than Jacob. So these things are forcing you to realize that there is such a thing as a different voice, a different perspective. Mm. And this is continued in the rabbinic literature. So you never get the Mishnah telling you what's the case. You always get Rabbi X says this, and Rabbi Y says that, and Rabbi Z comes along and has, says, how can he be right, and how can he be right, and Rabbi Alpha says, well, you're also right, and on it goes. And I will never forget that lovely statement in the Masechet Eruvin in the Talmud, which says, why was the view of Hillel accepted rather than the view of Shammai? Because the school of Hillel taught the views of their opponents as well as their own, and taught the views of their opponents before their own. In other words, it was active listening that so, made the law know, follow Hillel. I have to tell you, because when you said, <laughs> you said two contradictory things. <laughs> you said, as Jews, we're bad at listening. And then you said your wife, who I assume is Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I hope so, you know. I... <laughs> is the best listener whom you know. Yeah, she's so un-Jewish, you wouldn't believe it, but she really is a chief <laughs> Robertson and no. So I wanted to say that um, I, just, I learned something that was astonishing to me. I was in Israel last May, and I was invited to speak at the Knesset, and by uh, the women who were on the left in the Knesset. They, so I came and I talked, and after I talked, there was this very, very lively question period. And one of the women who was there said to me, do you know about Ezer Kenegdo? And I had never heard this phrase in Hebrew. I didn't know it at all. So it turns out that in Genesis, in the story you were just talking about, uh, after God creates Adam, the earthling, God sees that Adam needs a companion. He needs company. And first, God creates the animals. And then God says, this is not sufficient. God, what 
Adam, the earthly needs, is an ezer kinegdo. Now, you must, there must be Hebrew speakers in this audience. Ezer means helper. But ezer does not mean, there's no connotation of subordination or subservience because God is described as an ezer. Now, kinegdo means by opposing. Someone who helps by opposing. That is, by pulling or, or encouraging someone to move in a different direction than where they were headed. And God creates woman as an azer kinegdo. In other words, to help Adam by opposing. And one of the most fascinating things is, you know, as English speakers, we know this phrase from King James as helpmate or helpmate which I think is one of the most sort of egregious mistranslations <laughs> because it, it, it completely loses the sense of connecto, that one can help by opposing. So in a certain sense, right in, in Breshit, in Genesis, in the very beginning story of creation, is an extremely interesting, I mean, apropos, for example, women wage peace that women can help by opposing war. That's how we can help. Uh, and I think in terms of what this says about the Jewish tradition, that this is in Genesis. Um, and of course, Rashi says so. Um, he says, what Ezek Konegdo means is, if he's right, she helps him, and if, she's wrong, if he's wrong, she opposes him. And that's exactly... I think that's wrong. I think that's... that's <laughs> I think it's not what it means. <laughs> I, I think that's trying to kind of smooth it over. Yeah, of course. He was a bloke. Don't forget. Yeah, I know. I know. I think, I mean, I think from your response, there are a lot of people here who will understand this conversation. I mean, that to say no, it's not if he's wrong, but in other words, that... If you really want to help, I mean, I, I'm fascinated because in a way, I mean, you know, the sense of to help is one of the most, well, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary human, it's a human impulse. I mean, you can see it even in very young children. If someone's in distress, you want to help. But to help is one of the most, and certainly for women to be helpful is to be a good woman. But the idea is that the way you help is not to agree necessarily or to go along or to say, of course, you're right, <laughs> whatever you say, but that maybe the way to help and what, what is needed, why, I mean, the idea that this is why we women were created. And, yeah, and Adam gets it wrong at first. And the Bible is very subtle here because he opens his eyes, he sees his wife, and he says, Zotapam etsemayatsamay baza mibzari. Now I have found bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Lezoti kare isha, she shall be called woman. Hime ish lukachazot, because she was taken from man. And there, there, there are two things wrong with that. Number one, he gives her not a name but a noun, a generic description. And number two, he sees her as derivative of, and perhaps subsidiary to him. And then what happens, happens. The, the sin, the exile, and so on. And just as they are about to leave exile, there's a fascinating pair of verses. It says, and Adam called the name of his wife Chava, Chava. Eve, ki hi haita em kol chai, for she was the mother of all life. So he suddenly realizes that he got it wrong in thinking her of a as a generic helper, and he recognizes her as an individual by giving her a proper name. And that name signifies the thing that she can do, which incidentally God can do, bring new life into the world, that he cannot. And the very next verse says, and God made for them garments of skin, or Rabbi Meir translated garments of light, and he clothed mm -hmm. them. And then they left paradise. In other words, God finally forgives them. 
when Adam recognizes the individuality and independent integrity of his wife as the mother of all life. Doesn't the word chava mean life? Yes. So he calls her life. Yeah, the, the life giver. The, the giver, the one who gives birth to life, yes. You look like you have a different interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to avoid this. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think he calls her life. At least that's very arresting to me because before he explains it's because you give life and everything else, I wondered whether he experienced her as life. The, the and that's, Hebrew that's language yeah. as a very... The word for life in Hebrew is chayim. And it's a very interesting linguistic feature because chayim is a plural. So singular, although you can call an animal chai, uh, what, what, what's um, the, the a zoo is what? Gan chayot, yes? So an, an animal life can be in the singular, but human life cannot be in the singular. The word chayim, which is a slightly different word from chava, but the word chayim is always in the plural, so. What about chaya? What is that? Uh, no, that's... Uh, <laughs> That's, a, that's not a great word, actually. I, would, I wouldn't go down that road, Carol. Uh, <laughs> Vilda Chaya is a wild animal. <laughs> you don't want to know these things. Uh, that, that itself is separate from Chava. Chava is, uh, is one who gives life, and uh, Chavaya, incidentally, is an experience, a vivid experience. Slightly different words. I wanted to pull out two, a couple of words that we've heard tonight. One of them is... Uh, curiosity replacing judgment and radical listening. This is sort of in one basket and find out what the other side is for the other side and so on. And then this word opposition. And I'm thinking that uh, maybe those two baskets are not in opposition. Mm. And what appears to be oppositional at first may be a matter of radical listening and of this deep root, to the root curiosity about why the apparent opponent has the position that they do, the perspective that they do. Oh, we have to get rid of these visual metaphors. So, because I, um, I've heard from Kinegdo this, the importance of opposition, mm -hmm. but also in the effort to replace judgment with curiosity and to be open to radical listening we don't, we don't want to entrench in opposition, right? We want, we want. I think that this is where the Azer comes in because the idea of it's opposing to, in order, to, it's to help. So the idea of, I, I mean, it's, it's not opposing for the sake of opposition. <clears throat> right. yeah. It's not opposing to oppose. You know, the, the, one of the huge cultural problems today um, which is brought about by the internet, by smartphones, by social media, is what they call Google filters and Facebook likes. Oh, right. Which tend to filter out the views that are different from our own. And the end result is that we are surrounded. Our friends hand on to us the bits of journalism that they think support our cause, right. we... or sometimes the bits of journalism that speak to our sense of paranoia and persecution. And so you get these media filtering out uh, humanity into non-communicating sects of the like-minded, mm -hmm. which is really incredibly, incredibly dangerous. And, you know, um, Cass Sunstein, who, is, is he at Harvard He's now? He's at Harvard now, yeah. Is it Harvard now, is it Chicago? Um, did a couple of books, very, very important books. One of them was called Why Societies Need Dissent. That's Baruch Hashem, something we've never been short of in the <laughs> Jewish community. And more recently, he wrote a book called Going to Extremes, in which they've done lots of experiments where if you spend a lot of time with people who agree with you, mm -hmm. you will become, you and the group will become more and more extreme. Hmm. And all of these things, you know, are affecting not just politics in the Middle East, I suspect even 
politics in Europe and politics in the United States, so that what were once differences of opinion become today a little more like the children of light against the children of darkness. Mm -hmm. And you begin to get, you know, real deep chasms of fear and suspicion and misunderstanding and mm -hmm. the politics of the apocalypse. So I think that um, we've got work to do here. Some and, of the work we I have think to you're do leading. here is here. Oh. Um, uh, I have been told that at this point in the hour, I am to present you with some of the questions from um, the audience um, inspired by what you said so far. Um, and I'm going to combine two because uh, I think they're interesting together. So to, what's the difference between curiosity and listening on one hand and moral relativism on the other? Let's try that one. <laughs> and the real difference here is um, that intellectual curiosity comes from the fact, John Stuart Mill was great on this, but the rabbis were, that, we, that real intellectual engagement, whether at yeshiva or at university, is a collaborative pursuit of mm -hmm. truth, which only comes when you argue with and listen to the people who disagree with you. And that, out of that comes the, the collaborative pursuit of truth. And um, that is, in fact, you know, what, what Sir Karl Popper spoke about as scientific method. You expose hypotheses to refutation, you know, conjectures and refutations. There's a case in the Talmud where Rabbi Shimon Amsani, who had always used a certain exegetical principle was finally, well into his late career, somebody came up with a counterexample, one verse in the Bible to which it didn't apply. And he said, great, you know, I will now abandon all my previous life's teachings. And his student said, what? You just, this is one counterexample, you're gonna abandon your whole life's teachings. And he said, replied, Keshem she kibalti scha ala drisha kacha kabel scha ala brisha just as I had the reward for the exposition, so I will receive the war reward for the retraction. And that is Sir Karl Popper 2,000 years before Sir Karl Popper. So, uh, and as it happens, he was wrong, because if he'd only waited till Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva managed to answer the exception anyway. Moral relativism is the statement that there is no truth. So don't even try to collaboratively pursue it because it doesn't exist. Hmm. I was just thinking that, you know, I think the, the implication of the question is if I think that I have the moral truth, then why would I listen to anybody else? I mean, I think that's, so if I'm going to listen to somebody else, uh, it's because I think, I, I mean, it, it is because I think that I would be interested in their experience that maybe we would come together to a different truth. Hmm. I mean, I think that's the whole idea of it. So I think the fear that if I listen to you, I will lose my moral truth, that means I really can't listen to you. Hmm. So I think the premise of this question is, uh, it would lead you not to listen. So I think it, it, that to listen, I mean, one of the things about science that, that, that I think is so remarkable, and I talk with my students about it, is the thing about science is it's an argument from evidence. And that any theory or any explanation is always provisional. That's why every paper ends with more research needs to be done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like, as far as we know now, we would reach this conclusion, but we might know something new tomorrow, or we might discover something new, at which point, then we would reach a different conclusion. Mm -hmm. So when we argue, we argue from evidence, and then I think that opens us to, because evidence is experience, it's like arguing from experience. So I know my experience, but I don't know your experience. So if I knew your experience, it might change my argument. And I think we're not talking about 
different positions within one framework. We're really talking here about two different frameworks. And I think one framework really precludes listening. I mean, it makes, why would you listen? <laughs> There was, a, I was, there was a time when I was doing couples therapy with my colleague in Boston, Terence Real, and there was a, a man and a couple. You told your couple story, I'll tell a couple story. <laughs> Where a man kept asking his wife a question to which he knew the answer. And I remember turning to Terry at one point, and I said to him, why are you asking if you know? Uh, and I said to Terry, you know, if I know that it's 825, I don't turn to you, Rabbi Sachs, and say, what time is it? <laughs> oh, I keep a different time altogether. I, keep <laughs> Jew I only keep Jewish time, you know, that his relation to the real time is slightly provisional. <laughs> Finish the story. Well, no, so I mean, the story is, do we ask a question to which we know the answer, in which point we're really only I mean, we're not listening, we're testing the other person. Mm -hmm. uh, or do we ask a question because we think that from the other person we will learn something we don't know, and then on the basis of that discovery or that experience or that evidence, we might come to a different understanding of what in a situation uh, we might consider to be moral. Yeah. Yeah. There's also one other point that I must make here, that the issue at stake here is not just the question of truth. It's the question of justice. And there is a Roman law principle, which I think Judaism agrees with 100%. And that is justice requires alde alteram partem. Justice means listen to the other side. Mm. And unless you are capable of listening to the other side, you are incapable of justice. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was exactly um, Joel Hunter's point in find out why the other side is for the other side. Mm. And I think... You know, I think the, the judgment curiosity part that I don't want to get lost is it's not just replace judgment with curiosity, it's notice what happens when you replace judgment with curiosity. And it completely changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I, if I sort of catch myself and I'm sort of sitting and judging... And if I say, notice what happens if I replace judgment with curiosity, what happens is my whole relationship to the other person shifts. Mm -hmm. this, this reminds me of this wonderful story of two, two guys who are f doing frisbee throwing in Central Park. And um, a Japanese tourist who hasn't seen frisbee throwing before is standing, them, standing there watching them for half an hour and after half an hour, he comes up to them and says, I've been watching you doing this for half an hour. I'm really impressed, but tell me, which one of you is winning? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that allows you to reframe things. Right. Not everything is a binary, okay. I win, right. you lose, sometimes. The whole essence of the interchange is that you both test and enhance the perception yeah. and the skills of the other. The next question actually builds right on this, so I'm going to plunk it out right now. Um, and I think it uh, uh, points to some of the same principles. How do you listen to people who want to destroy you? <laughs> In my humble opinion, you can't listen to people who won't give you a hearing. You can't listen what? You, you, uh, you cannot listen to people who won't give give you a hearing. Listening means, as you've said so eloquently, a basic, a basic assertion of respect for both sides. Mm -hmm. And so the result is that we have to show people as powerfully as we can that no gain was ever really finally achieved by violence that those who really refuse to respect the other will never be respected by any other. And that some, uh, look, you know, I, as I say, I've, I've battled this pretty hard uh, ever since 9-11 through my books, Dignity of Difference and Not in God's Name. And I've been trying to 
really say to Jews and Christian, uh, Jews, uh, to Christians and Muslims throughout the world, that all of us, children of Abraham, at least, concede our basic right to be, and now let's wrestle with our sibling rivalry. But I find it quite difficult, and I refuse to engage in public conversation with a radical who fails to recognize my right or my people's right to exist. Carol? Well, of course, I'm very curious. Why did they want to destroy me? I mean, I mean, I, that, that's where I would begin. Um, and because it doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, almost in the same sense, what would they gain by that? And the idea that somehow, I mean, I think it's, it's very much the same thing we were talking about before. The idea if I could destroy everyone on earth who disagreed with me, <clears throat> then what? I would, I would live in peace, I doubt it. I mean, the sense that I can't tolerate somebody being on this earth with me who doesn't see things the way I see. I mean, there's such a, there's, there's such a set of assumptions wrapped up into that. I wonder, so, um, there are times when someone is trying to destroy you, but I, in my experience, there are also times when people fear that someone is trying to destroy them. And with a different kind of listening, you may get to the root of things that show a different relationship yeah. and a different situation. If you can, if you have the hearing, the space, maybe the facilitation of the kind you, Jonathan talked about. You know, Marsha, you, you started at the beginning talking about covenant. Yeah. And I think, you know, I found myself thinking, because I think the way I heard you, and I don't know if that's right, was that you implied there had to be a covenant in order to enter into listening. But to me, it's through listening that you come to a covenant. <clears throat> so the idea is I don't have to be in some relationship with you in order to listen to you, but it is through listening to you that I find myself coming into relationship with you because otherwise, I don't know who I'm in relationship with, yeah. honestly. Yeah. If I can just tell you a story that I found quite moving, it's, it's quite a, it's a story with stages. In around, I think, 2002, an American journalist from the Wall Street Journal called Daniel Poe mm -hmm. was murdered by um, jihadist terrorists in Karachi. <clears throat> His last words, they made him say, I am a Jew. And um, I got to know Daniel's father, Judea Pearl, who's, I think, a professor of computer science on the West Coast in, I think, UCLA. And I also got to know the Pakistani High Commissioner in London, Akbar Ahmed, um, from Karachi, who uh, today holds the Ibn Khaldun Chair in Islamic Civilizations at the American University in Washington. And I discovered that they knew each other and were fr had become friends. And I made a half an hour program about them for, the BB for BBC television, showing Judea and, and Akbar speaking together mm. in our home, and then I took them together to a Jewish school, the JFS, and a, a Muslim school, the Islamia school, and, you know, just showed the reaction that Jewish pupils had and Muslim pupils had to this coming together of two people who might have been thought to hold great hatred for one mm -hmm. another. Mm -hmm. And I asked Judea what, what had led him to seek out Akbar, and he said, hatred killed my son. Mm -hmm. So I will devote the rest of my life to fighting hatred. Now, that program made a certain impact. But what was really interesting is that Akbar, who, as I said, moved from England to America, where he teaches, had a daughter called Dr. Amina Hoti, who was originally teaching at Cambridge, at our Cambridge, not your Cambridge, and uh, 
He's now teaching in Pakistan. And we had a little conference in London in January, and she came and spoke and showed us a little video. And Amina, Akbar's daughter, is now teaching my book, Dignity of Difference, in Pakistan to students from Waziristan who were Al-Qaeda people mm. and who have now become peace activists. She can't do this in the name of interfaith dialogue because all interfaith tuition is banned in Pakistan, but she's doing it in the name of tolerance. And I, I have to say, and let me, not only have you courageously led our Jewish thought here, but I, I am absolutely astonished by the courage of so many Muslim women today who are the most powerful moderating and, mm -hmm. and moderate voices within Islam, and many of them are famous. Amina is not so well known except in Pakistan. But to see this woman dealing with these most extreme people who certainly did not concede my right to exist, and somehow by teaching, getting them to encounter some of my teachings, and they've now become peace activists, it just tells you that we're too wrong to give up altogether on hope. I think that's And that people can change. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to um, come up now, this time truly combine, but I just will take a point that, um, to uh, reassure you that in my last two questions, that I didn't say just so that I don't misrepresent myself to you that covenant um, uh, is the precondition for listening, but rather also that listening brings us into yeah. a covenantal reciprocity. And I think if we can, in this note of hope, if we can hold on to that, even when things look very dire mm -hmm. and we fear, as Thomas Hobbes said, fear is the mo most powerful motivator. Um, then I think it's, it's when you're afraid, it's very hard to listen. listen. Yeah. 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 Um, the, the two last questions that I think we might have time for is how do we listen in an era of fake news? And um, what about the lost verses of um, silence? In particular, this person wrote about the women who were kept silence about uh, uh, <coughs> sexual abuse. What are the, what's, what's the question about? So one was fake news, right? How do we listen in an era of fake news? And the second one, so I'll let you pick up where you want, is uh, what about, could you comment on the lost voices of women who have kept silent? Well, the, um, the, the, the thing is so interesting is they didn't lose their voices because we're hearing them now. And I think, I remember I was on a train in Japan with a young woman and I made the comment, no one loses their voice. And people, and I always think for good reason, there are reasons why we hold our voices in silence. We may do that for a long, long time. In fact, it was really funny when I was in Israel. One of, one of the extraordinary experiences I had is a good friend of mine took me <clears throat> to meet a woman named Tamar Eshel, who's 97 years old. And uh, I'm writing a novel that it involves um, the 48 war, and I was very interested in people, Israelis, who had been involved with the Palmach at that time and really been in Israel. So this extraordinary woman, I mean, she's 97 years old and she was all bent over when I first met her. And we started to talk about her experiences in, in the Palmach and so forth. And um, she, actually, she was born in London. She was a British citizen and therefore she was used by the intelligence even before, uh, by the yeshuv, I mean, going way, way, way back. Anyway, this woman just came to life. It was amazing. She talked for two and a half hours straight. <laughs> but one of the things she kept saying is that there were certain things that were secrets. And, that she, and I thought, are you going to take these to your grave? I mean, <laughs> you know, here it is, however many years later, and she still wasn't going to tell about the secrets of the intelligence and the, in the yeshuv and whatever. So anyway, I was telling you about this Japanese train, and there I am with this young Japanese woman, and she suddenly says, I have to write this down. No one loses, their, no one loses her voice. 
And I think what you see now with this whole Me Too and women coming forward is women may have been silent for a long time. And I personally happen to think when someone doesn't speak, there's a very good reason why. And they often know something. And I think when people think they're not going to be heard, or their experiences is going to be questioned, or they're going to be told that they're crazy, or that they're making it up, or that what they know couldn't have happened, or something like that, it's actually quite wise not to speak. But what you see now is the people who didn't speak for years, when the resonance changes, I have a friend who calls it that what we need is a cello world. That is a world where when we speak, there's a sounding board, so what comes back is enlarged. It's even more sound. That when the resonance suddenly shifted, suddenly everyone had a voice. And you know, one of the things from my experience in the years where I was working with girls and spending a lot of time with nine, 10, and 11-year-old girls who certainly have a voice. I remember at that time, the Boston Globe, you know, it's really, you know, and people who say, we want girls to have their voices, I say, they do, you know, and would you like to listen to, to what they have to say? Um, <laughs> but um, I, I remember the girls, there was an article about Harvard psychologists, you know, helps girls to find their voices, and the girls said, you know, we have our voices which they do, I mean, what I was thinking of. I mean, just to give you one example, we were talking one afternoon about it. It's the kind of thing you talk about with children. Is it ever good to tell a lie? And one 11-year-old from an inner city school, you know, in Boston says, my house is wallpapered with lies. So people who say, we want girls to have their voices, I always say, really? I mean, do you really want to hear what girls will say if they tell you what they see? But what was striking to me in traveling around the world with girls was how often in the course of the day, girls are told, shh, don't say this. People won't appreciate it if you say this. Don't say this, you know, basically don't say what you're really feeling and thinking. And when I was interviewing adolescent girls, I learned to do something you know, which was the opposite of what I had been told to do as a researcher. And I think it's because, maybe this is because I'm Jewish, but I, I get bored very easily. I have very little tolerance for sort of canned stories or rehearsed things. And so I would find myself interviewing adolescent girls and I would hear something that struck me as not terribly interesting. And I would start to say to girls, is that true? <laughs> or do you believe that? Or do you really feel that way? And what would come back was the word actually. <laughs> like a girl who said to me, I don't like myself enough to look out for myself. And I thought, well, that's really sad. And I said, do you really feel that way? She said, actually. And then she told me, this is how I look out for myself, by never saying what I'm feeling and thinking. And I actually, would, actually, I'm using the word now. I was astonished because I've read and I've actually written at great length about Anna Frank's diary, which I find fascinating because she edited her diary, which I didn't know, many people don't know. And that's mostly what we read was the edited version. But in what turned out to be, sadly, the, her last diary entry, she says in her diary, where she's writing in her diary to this imaginary friend Kitty, I never say what I'm really feeling and thinking. So I think the pressures on us as women not to say what we're feeling and thinking not to say what we see or to act as if we don't know what we know is huge. And one of the reasons that I find it so exhilarating, this woman wage peace, is I feel that's a group of women who has decided we are going to say what we really feel and think about what's going on in this conflict. And what we really feel and think is it's got to stop. Yeah. <clears throat> How do we listen or who to whom do we listen in an age of fake news? There's a report and an editorial in today's Times, London Times, which is very interesting. Until now, no newspaper has been able to make a profit with the fact that so much news is today read on the web in Google News and things. And for the first time now, young people are beginning to say in increasing numbers, we are willing to pay for good journalism. Mm. 
because of the impact of fake news. And one of the very, you know, it, it, any newspaper or any broadcasting medium that establishes an impeccable re reputation for telling the truth come what may. I mean, the BBC World Service, for instance, in many countries of the world allowed a certain voice to be heard that would never be heard otherwise back in the old days. And so I think people are, are now reacting against fake news because they do want to know that I can listen to something I can trust. The second thing about, um, you know, the, 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 the voices that are being heard just now in the past few weeks about sexual harassment and abuse. One of the things I did, I mean, it was scary at the time. The year before I became chief rabbi, I was to an, organize a big conference in London called Traditional Alternatives on Women. It was the first time that the community and the rabbinate had heard the pain and the anger mm. of Jewish women at the way they were treated in Jewish law. And it became terribly important to have created that arena where they could speak and know that they were being listened to. That eventually fueled what was 20 or 22 years of actually working to ameliorate that situation. We had to learn to listen before we could make the necessary changes, because people didn't want to listen. And finally, I just end with, you know, a very obvious point, but a powerful one. The Hebrew Bible talks about, uh, you, has two cases where the word Torah, Jewish teaching, is used in connection with an abstract noun, a, a moral noun, and Malachi talks about the priest, and Torah, Emet al pihu, the law of truth is on his tongue. And the famous Eshet Chayel, the last chapter of the book of Proverbs that we recite every Friday evening, talks about the woman of Eshet Chayel, which I translate as the woman of strength. Mm. It says, Torah Chesed, Allah the law of kindness and compassion is on her tongue. It's a little known fact that for 2,000 years, Hebrew was a language spoken only by men. Because from the days of the Mishnah, the lingua franca was Aramaic, mm. and then Yiddish, and then Ladino. So um, only rabbis actually communicated in Hebrew, and there were no women rabbis. So it was a language only spoken about by men. And only in the last 150 years or so has the woman's voice, the different voice, come back into the Hebrew language, and we know what was missing. There was plenty of law of truth, but too little law of compassion. That was the different voice. And now I hope all of us have been listening, and I salute these two wonderful women who have me completely outnumbered but it would have all of us completely entranced. Thank you. I'd like to thank our guests very much, Carol Gilligan and Jonathan Fax. Thank you very much for being a wonderful audience and for your wonderful questions. Thank you.